So the Queen is seated and that's uh, been her composure all the during this visit. Very happy, happy, very relaxed. She's been smiling all the way through on this and one they've so just far. put a blanket over her knees there, so that should <laughs> yes. keep her warm while she's up there. But his resplendent that is in Lieutenant Spons. Governor John Blackair to her right. And William Davis, the Premier of Ontario, on her left. And back in there behind Premier Davis is the Honorable Barbara McDougall, the Minister of State in the Mulroney government. And back come the dance. Scarlet and Bearskin. But this is an old favorite called um, There's Something About a Sailor. Or Soldier, if you wish. General's foot guards. And in this group, you'll hear Melanola, British Grenadiers, and Colonel Bogey. resist but clap for that one. That's right. <laughs> I think they're keeping their hands warm too, Lloyd.
the regiments here tonight, of which Her Majesty is Colonel-in-Chief, the Governor General's foot guard. The story of Canada's defense forces is as old as the history of Canada itself. In New France, as early as 1651, Pierre Boucher, captain of Trois-Rivières, formed the beleaguered settlers into militia units. Throughout the French regime, during the British colonial period, and since Confederation, the militia has been vital to the preservation of Canadian society and to national defense. This emphasis on militia, the volunteer citizen who trains in his spare time, has been one of the hallmarks of the Canadian military system. The roots of the militia were planted in New France and extended deeply along the shores of the St. Lawrence and the Great Lakes, where traditions firmly embedded flourished. The early pioneer had much to offer as a militia volunteer because he was accustomed to long hours of hard work, both on the farm and in the forests. As Carrère de Bois and Voyageur, he had the ability to travel long distances under arduous conditions in all seasons, which made him invaluable both to the fur trade and the army. Moreover, his long residence in Canada had acclimatized him to terrain and weather. Having learned from the Indians their native skills and wood lore, he became a formidable opponent in guerrilla or irregular warfare in the forests of North America. After the fall of New France, the British presence would influence and enhance the roots of French traditions that would continue to the present day. These traditions came from the 78th Fraser Highlanders, raised in Scotland in 1757 as the Second Highland Battalion of Foot. They were the only Highland regiment with General Wolfe on the Plains of Abraham in 1759. Traditions came also from the King's Royal Regiment of New York, raised by Sir John Johnson in 1776. Two battalions would augment the defenses of the Canadas against the potential invader from the South during the American Revolutionary War. They came from the United Empire Loyalists, whose relocation from the American colonies to British North America was very much a military operation. The Loyalists were organized into companies under specially commissioned captains and traveled in military transports to Halifax and Quebec. Land was surveyed and distributed by military engineers and army officers. The plan for establishing military colonies did not long survive the problem of first settlement, but the principle was revived again in 1792 when Lieutenant Governor John Graves Simcoe raised the Queen's Rangers for Upper Canada to assist in the erection of public buildings, bridges, roads, and at any other civil or military duty that His Majesty's service might require. British regulars in Canada included the Royal Artillery, prominent in the defenses of 1812, and the King's 8th Regiment of Foot. The 1st Battalion of Volunteer Incorporated Militia of Upper Canada saw for the first time in 1813 integrated regular and militia soldiers into a functional unit. The Loyalists in the militia ranks, ragged as they were in 1837, were turned out in defiance of the Mackenzie Rebellion in Upper Canada. From 1840 to 1860, frontiersmen from the rural areas of the Canadas formed into military groups like the Upper Canada Rifles, eventually emerging on official lists of the Canadian militia. From 1860 to the Northwest Rebellion of 1885, the Queen's Own Rifles of Canada and the 10th Royal Grenadiers, later to become the Royal Regiment of Canada, gave Toronto her first two infantry regiments. Depicted here in frontier days, their descendants would record their continuing valor at Juno Beach and Dieppe during the Second World War.
1891, Toronto received her third regiment of infantry, and Ontario received her first kilted regiment when the 48th Highlanders of Canada were raised. They, like many other Canadian soldiers, answered the Empire's call in South Africa at the turn of the century, and again in 1914, and again in 1939. Through the 50s, and more recently, militia volunteer soldiers have augmented their regular force brothers in peacekeeping duties whenever called upon to do so. Today, Central Militia Area encompasses all of Ontario except the Thunder Bay District, with 42 units of the reserve force. These comprise six armored or armored reconnaissance regiments, five artillery regiments, two engineer units, 21 infantry regiments and service battalions, and medical companies whose vital support enables all others to function. These are all volunteers, citizen soldiers, mindful of the fact that in the service of their country, where they are needed, there they will be. There really is something about a soldier. Beautiful visual display of the 200 years of history of, of the soldier. It's quite amazing. Yes, and the tableau explained to us by Henry Shannon, the public address announcer, referring to, again, referring to the United Empire Loyalists, who are such an important factor in this part of the country. There's something about a soldier. 